السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We start by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his entire household all his companions we ask Allah to bless them all and to bless every single one of us and to bless the beautiful children who have come to the masjid today and to bless the mothers who are trying to look after them we indeed reach out to you and like I said we love you for the sake of Allah we also have children and our children are also quite normally and naturally unruly sometimes and at the same time we are very tolerant to this and we pray that Allah grant these children great success in the dunya and in the akhirah. Amen. My mothers and sisters, just to commence with a little message for you, we really appreciate the fact that you have made the effort to come here. We know that you have so many responsibilities, perhaps more than us as men. And we also know that it is not easy to look after the children. And this is why we are praying for you at the beginning of this talk to say, may Allah bless you. May Allah open your doors. May He make it easy for you. And may He grant you a smile on your face. There, was, there were a few children, mashallah, who were uh, wailing, should I say, or perhaps who were slightly vocal, if I can word it more respectfully. Uh, we really ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant those children success in this world and the next and to grant their mothers a good reward for being patient with them and continue to be patient with them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. The reason why I started this way is because we made an announcement a few moments ago for the sisters uh, to be mindful of the children who might be vocal as I worded it. And the reason is not because we are not tolerant of it, but sometimes, like I said, there is a limit of beyond which it would be within disturbance of the others. And for this reason, we say, we start off with a prayer for you because we know you really want to listen to the talk and we know that you really would like to concentrate, but at the same time, you have given preference to looking after your own child, subhanAllah. May Allah grant you and your children goodness and all of us. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Ramadan is around the corner and we all know that. Which corner? I don't know. Every time we say something is around the corner and I say which corner, they say we don't know. But that's the terminology. It means it's very near. It's very, very near. Ramadan is very near. So what is the month all about? The month is about rejuvenating and reinvigorating and perhaps uh, restarting, rekindling a relationship upon a very high level with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the month of Ramadan. Every year it returns, it comes back, and it is a gift for us so that we can rekindle that link with Allah upon a very high level. Why do I say a very high level? Because we all do have a link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in Ramadan, if you notice, things are on sale. Do you know what that means? Sometimes people enter a supermarket. It happens to me, I know. You know, you walk into BHS or Next or somewhere, Mother Care and what have you, and you look at something and it seems a little bit dear, slightly expensive. And you tell yourself, I know when the sales will be, then I will come back. And as soon as the sales start, you are there the next day, whatever you wanted is less than half the price. Sometimes 30%, meaning 70% knocked off. So you are quick to buy whatever you need. And sometimes you even buy what you don't need. Why? Because it's very cheap. This is why it's dangerous to walk into a shop where things are very, very cheap. Because you might end up buying things you are going to stash away into your cupboards, never using them, but you only bought it because it was very cheap. And that's not the proper uh, etiquette of a Muslim. You don't just buy things because they are cheap. If you want to buy certain things, you either make use of it or you give it away. So when it comes to Ramadan, we all know that you earn bonus rewards. Bonus. For one good deed, it is multiplied so many fold. You give out a sadaqah in Ramadan, it is multiplied so many fold. You do a good deed and a charitable deed, it is really multiplied because you are in the condition of fasting. And at the same time, you have the softness of the heart that is brought about by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a miraculous way in the month of Ramadan. So many blessings that I guarantee you, when you open your fast in the month of Ramadan, the food tastes different. Amazing. The food, there is something about it that makes you look forward to it. Do you know if I were to give you some bread and yogurt with a, a date right now, you may enjoy it. But to enjoy bread and yogurt with some dates at the time of iftar is something unique. 
Sometimes people who do not really have yogurt on a regular basis cannot wait for Ramadan to have that little yogurt and dip that piece of bread in it and have it. It's the blessing of Allah. لِسَّائِمِ فَرْحَتَانِ فَرْحَةٌ عِنْدَ فِطْرِهِ وَفَرْحَةٌ عِنْدَ لِقَاءِ رَبِّهِ The Prophet says, a person who is fasting has two points of happiness. Happiness upon opening the fast, meaning the completion of the fast, and happiness when he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or she meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this would mean two things. One is, on a daily basis when you're opening the fast, your reward is plugged in and you have so much of happiness and barakah and blessings in so many different ways. And two is, when the month is over, you have a day known as Eid, which is a day of happiness. So that too is a day that is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is prohibited to fast on the day of Eid. And we all know that. Prohibited. So Allah says, you, are, you must eat. You have to have something. You cannot. We are instructing you to eat in the same way we instructed you not to eat before. This is the instruction of Allah. So a blessed month. How do we look forward to the month of Ramadan? Let's look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Come the month of Sha'ban, which is the month just prior to the month of Ramadan, he started increasing his voluntary fasting. He was increasing his voluntary fasting. And if you take a look at his sunnah and his path, he was not a person who fasted in the month of Ramadan and that's it. But because fasting has so many benefits, both physical as well as spiritual, he used to fast on a regular basis every week, Monday and Thursday. He used to fast. Sunnah. Something that medicine of today has confirmed. The non-Muslims have researched it and confirmed that your health is definitely positively impacted, including your emotional, mental condition by fasting twice a week. And they've spaced it out such that they arrived at the conclusion Monday and Thursday. Amazing. I actually have seen this on BBC myself. I don't know if some of you might have seen the clip as well. Subhanallah. And it's amazing when we say it's a sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even the weak from amongst us start thinking, yeah, you know, it's just a sunnah. Don't use the word just a sunnah. A sunnah is something magnificent. It is a gift of Allah to us via Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at it, study it, see. But when the non-Muslims come about with the same in terms of discovery, we say, wow, I'm going to start fasting twice a week. Subhanallah. Now we have a bonus here because we have the sunnah as well as the discoveries. Both are together. So let us start inshallah. Try it at least sometime. Like you know, sunnah is not fara. Sunnah meaning that which was encouraged by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it was not made compulsory. It is not compulsory. But it has its merits. It has benefits in it which are amazing. So I'd like to promote it from this platform to say my brothers and sisters, including myself, try out this fast. Monday and Thursday. If not every Monday and Thursday, at least sometimes, you know, try it out. See the benefit you have. You fast, you arrive at a new level of spirituality. Believe me, trust me. It is just like Salat al-Tahajjud. Tahajjud is the pre-Fajr prayer, which we always say, if you have not engaged in it, try it out at least a few times in your life. Come on, try it out. I'm sure we can be strong enough to do that. We can try it. So get up once a month and say, you know what, let me try the Hajjud. Do it, see what happens to you. I promise you, something will change in you permanently. Do you know that? Try it for the sake of Allah. Get up, put your clock only for Allah. And you know what? Nowadays, Fajr is quite early, especially in this country here. So a lot of us are awake up to late because that is the general norm in the weekends in the Middle East. You know, you, you're awake most of the time because it's so hot during the day. So now, you'd rather fulfill your tahajjud at least. You know, some people say, okay, you must sleep before you read tahajjud. To be honest, it's not a condition. It's not a condition for the tahajjud to be correct. You can actually read it even though you have not slept. Fulfill it and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it. Try it out. And then also try the fasting. The, the voluntary fasting and you see what would happen when Ramadan comes in it clocks in smoothly and you have a beautiful high that you are starting upon when I say a high here I'm talking of a spiritual high mashallah. Uh, also Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had something else which was extremely unique extremely unique he taught us that three days of the month in the middle fast if you can it's a sunnah sunnah meaning again Encouraged by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He did it and for us to emulate it, we would achieve a reward for it. So if you take a look at this, 13th, 14th and 15th of the lunar calendar, he used to fast. And the idea is every good deed is multiplied by 
10 subhanallah so 3 multiplied by 10 would make it 30 30 is the whole month you get a reward for the entire month so if you fast those three days, it would be equivalent to having fasted the entire month. But you achieve such a big reward, such a big reward. And on top of that, your health, you know, physically, mentally, you, you have arrived at a new level, which you will only pick up some time later. This is the gift of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah, I once again say, my brothers and sisters, let us promise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will try this out. You know, we know that it is not compulsory, and I reiterate, it's a sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa but it's important. Important meaning, try it out. Let's see, may Allah make me strong as well, and all of us. Amen. My brothers and sisters, this is one way of looking forward to the month of Ramadan, by promising Allah these things. Look, Ya Allah, I'm going to fast, not only in Ramadan, but even outside Ramadan, because we have a problem. What is the problem? The problem is, in a lot of cases, we tend to worship Allah correctly only in the month of Ramadan. Come Ramadan, the alcohol is thrown aside, the music CDs are thrown aside, everything else is thrown aside, the zina is stopped. May Allah forgive us all and protect us. Everything bad is stopped and we become such a good person. Why? Because they saw the moon. They saw the moon. So we become brilliant people and you know what happens? May Allah forgive us. As soon as the other moon is sighted, everything comes back. It's like the day of Eid means I am doing qada for the food that I did not have. And I'm doing qada for all the sins that I abstained from during Ramadan. Here goes. Now you're on a roller coaster once again. If that is the case, What a bad nation who only worships Allah in the month of Ramadan. He is the same Allah. Do you know the contentment you feel in Ramadan can be prolonged even beyond for the next 11 months on condition that you just ensure that you are pleasing Allah in a similar fashion. When I worshipped Allah in Ramadan, I, I made sure my salah was in order, at least my farad. Continue the farad, the compulsory salah even after Ramadan. Make sure you are there. You know, we have something known as taraweeh, which is also a sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The prolonged prayer wherein we listen to the entire Quran in most cases. And that is a sunnah also of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is prolonged. And one of the ideas here would also be for us to enjoy it. Imagine a prolonged salah is known as a tarweeha. If you look at the deep meaning of the Arabic language of that word, it is to do with your comfort. It is to do with something easy going. It is to do with something that is giving you a break. But it is salah that is prolonged. How many of us truly receive comfort when we prolong in salah? It's something unique. If you look at it, it shows that the way we look at salah sometimes is actually wrong. Let's be honest. A lot of us look at salah as a responsibility being a burden rather than a responsibility being a gift that we should be honored to engage in. Like I always say, and I've said it from this seat as well in the past, my brothers and sisters, there is a difference between a person who fulfills salah because he has to do it and another who fulfills it because he wants to fulfill it. Very big difference. You know, there comes a time when someone says, why are, you, why are you reading your salah? And the person will say, because I have to. It's a duty. That's correct. The answer is not wrong. But there comes a time when a person wants to read that salah. They're looking forward. They know it's a duty, but they don't stop at that. They really want to. In that case, they will start working on the quality of the salah rather than the quantity. Because if you're doing it because you have to, you come in and you just down and up and down and up and you finish your salah and you're out. You say, Alhamdulillah. And you know, we are done. Allahumma anta salam. And you walk out and everything is gone. But if you read it because you want to, you come in and you take your time, you stand correctly, you have made wudu properly, and Allahu Akbar, when you start your prayer, you are plugged in with Allah, nothing distracts you and you can lengthen it. The longer you prolong, the more you enjoy it. Is that what happens to us? May Allah make us that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us that. You know, obviously this address is not to the imams, because the imams are given instruction by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to consider the elderly and the weak who are behind them. So it doesn't mean that you know you need to uh, just stand in salah for so long, subhanallah, and you are an imam knowing that people are perhaps 
weak and elderly, sometimes even the children are perhaps crying and so on behind. The Prophet ﷺ's teaching is to shorten it slightly in that particular case. But sometimes, and I know this has happened and I must mention it, you get some elderly, I have had some elderly who've come to me. They say, Shaykh, you know what, I'm old and my legs are sore. So please shorten the salah. But my brother, my, you know, I really respect you. You are my elder brother. I have read something so short. He says, no, you must shorten it more because my legs are sore. That is also a misinterpretation. You do not shorten it beyond the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where I just say, you know, I start my salah and I say, okay, there's weak people who are weak at the back. So every salah is, inna a'atayna kal kawthar and qul huwa allahu ahad. Every salah. By default, without even thinking, It happens. When does that happen? When you are worried about getting rid of the salah, or let's word it better, when you are worried about just fulfilling it without actually wanting. Your heart is not wanting to plug in. If you want to plug in, you will make an effort to learn the Quran. You will make an effort to look at it. And this brings me to another point. We want to welcome the month of Ramadan. It is known as the month of the Quran. It is known as the month of the Qur'an. It is wrong for us just to start Ramadan and we open the Qur'an. You know, people say, okay, Ramadan started. Did you start your khatma? You say, yes, I started it. So we start from the beginning, from Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. We get to Alif Lam Mim and we continue. And every day we put a marker. And we say, by the time 29 days are up, I must be finished these 30 at least once. That's good, but it's not good enough. To be honest with you, there is always room to improve. Why are we not reading the Qur'an now? I mean, what's wrong? We might not see Ramadan. Do you agree? How many of you, including myself, have a guarantee that we are actually going to see the first day of Ramadan? Can anyone raise their hand and say, I'm definitely going to see the first day of Ramadan? Anyone? No one. Not at all. So start from now. And this is why the hadith says, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ bin-niyat." You will be rewarded for your deeds according to your intentions. So you start saying, Ya Allah, this is your kalam. It is your word. Whether it's Ramadan or not, it is still your word. And Ya Allah, I'm starting to read it from today. And I want to encourage you. You see, we have so many talks. And mashallah, even at this venue, we've had so many talks. And so many brilliant scholars from across the globe have come and spoken. The reality is, have we made an immediate resolution? Question. Have you ever sat in a talk and made an immediate resolution to say, here and now, I'm starting this? That is the winner. That is the winner. This is why I say, we spoke about fasting and we said, inshallah, make a resolution. We spoke about tahajjud, we said, make a resolution. Have you noticed? So I hope you made one of the two. We spoke, now we're speaking about the Quran, make a resolution. Start tonight. Don't say, okay, tomorrow morning, first thing I'm starting, too late. Tomorrow, you might not see tomorrow. I'm, I'm making an intention as soon as I leave from here, or before I leave, I'll pick up the Quran from here, one of the masahif, and I will read the Arabic one verse with its meaning, then I will walk out. Possible. Or, today we have the gadget, known as the phone. You choose the translation you want. I prefer the Sahih International. I find it to be very easy in language. And subhanallah, read the Arabic text. Learn how to read it. Nowadays you have a little button on your phone, depending on the application you are using. It will recite the verse for you and you can repeat it so you can correct your recitation. And choose which reciter you want. You want to have this reciter, the other reciter, mashallah, you will have them. Touch of the button. But we know how to use the application of the bank. Why? Because it's important. We know how to use the application, the other applications of WhatsApp. You know, I asked someone uh, a few moments ago, do you have WhatsApp? He says, I have WhatsApp, not just me, but even my trouser has WhatsApp. Subhanallah. <laughs> if you don't have WhatsApp in this age, you are... Nobody. That's what some people say. Subhanallah. I would like to think the idea is technology. To keep in touch. To keep in touch with who? With everyone else. Brothers and sisters, keep in touch with your maker. You need him more desperately than anyone else. Wallahi. And I'm serious. Keep in touch with your maker. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need him more than anyone else. So you have WhatsApp. Do you have the Quran on your phone? Do you have it? And subhanAllah, people might say, well, if I do, how can I go to the toilet and so on? There are rulings issued by the ulama. I can very quickly make mention. If your application is open, 
You should not use that phone to go into the toilet. But you close the application, your screen is blank, meaning it is closed completely. You can go in, there is no harm. It is something digital. It's like a hafid of the Quran. If he's reciting the Quran, he cannot walk into the loo, but he's quiet. The Quran is in his heart. He can go in and he must not waste time in the toilet. That's another beautiful teaching of Islam. When we go to the loo, we are not going there to have fun. You know, if you go into some loos, you see magazines, especially those in some places who play golf. I recall very clearly when I was a little bit younger I entered one man's you know the loo in one man's home and on the top you know the shanks the top he had the rules of golf and wallahi you won't believe what I'm telling you but some of you might have seen it because now they sell it on an international scale they have a small golf green in the toilet meaning a small little makeshift thing with a mini putter and a golf ball and whilst you're sitting you're busy putting <laughs> whilst you're sitting you're busy putting I'm not joking I'm honest with you you can Google it and check it, but please don't buy it. <laughs> so they're putting. Why? Because they're wasting their time. We are taught as Muslims, you go to the loo, it is known as liqada al haja in order to finish your business. You go in there, you relieve yourself and you come out. There is a dua to read before you enter and as you exit. To ask Allah protection from the devil because we are taught that sometimes shaitan infests those areas. So you go in and you come out. Please don't play golf in the loo and stop reading magazines and all that in the toilet. I know so much so that last week someone sent me an image on WhatsApp and I must share this with you because I just remembered it now. And it showed a man sitting on a pan and he, he said, oh no, I forgot my phone. Do you know what that means? That means people have made it their business that before you go to the loo, look for your phone. So that you can spend time now, you're sitting on WhatsApp, messaging people and so on. You know what happened to me a few weeks ago, I can't remember which airport it was, but there was a man speaking inside the toilet. I was waiting to come out and he's busy having a long conversation. And I, I, I wanted to tell him that, hey, finish up your business and get out, there's a queue here, man. And he was like, if you offered him coffee, he probably would have said, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> This is dangerous. I am the reason why I'm making mention of it. This is what is overtaking the globe at the moment. People are not understanding what their preferences are. And we were talking about developing a link with Allah. You need to get into the loo and come out of the loo. But remember something, in the same way we get so excited when we have Skype, when we have WhatsApp, when we have so many other types of or other formats. In Far East Asia, they have WeChat and they have Line and so on. All these different, you know, Tango and Viber and you name it, it's there. That is good. And mashallah, you, let's hope we are using it for something beneficial and good. But ask yourself, have I developed a small relation at least with the one who made me? When I go back to him, everything else will remain behind. Everything else will remain behind. You know, we look for the latest phones and so on. Have you even used technology to get closer to Allah? And I like to say, you know, today people don't like to read. Do you agree? Do you agree? Yes. It's more difficult to read. If you give them a CD, it's easier. You give them a DVD, it's even more easier. And subhanAllah, it's on your phone. So you have YouTube, you have this, it's easier. So good. You want to listen to a lecture? You want to know something about Ramadan? Instead of reading a book about Ramadan today, they say, let's listen to a YouTube about Ramadan. Inshallah, we meet at half eight. Very good. Allah knows that slowly but surely, we will change such that we become lazy to read. Yet we all know the importance of reading. And I'm underscoring this. It's important for us to read. At the same time, what we need to know, technology has developed such that it caters for our laziness, yet we don't use it. You follow what I'm saying? Technology caters for our laziness, but we still don't use it. Wallahi, we will be asked by Allah. Wallahi, we will be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how did you use this technology to get closer to me? How? And answer the question. So the Qur'an, don't wait for the month of the Qur'an to come and misunderstand that that's the month of the Qur'an and the other 11 months are not the months of the Qur'an. So therefore we will be concentrating on Qur'an one month and the other 11 months the Qur'an is somewhere else. We pack it away until it receives dust. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Take your phone tonight. Download a beautiful app of the Qur'an. 
There are so many apps. Ask your friends, inshallah, for what is a good app that they have found beneficial. You have an application that has recitals. It has the meaning in so many languages. It has a brief explanation. And at the same time, it will help you to recite the Arabic because as Muslims, we are responsible for two things. One is to recite in the Arabic language and two is to understand in whatever language we speak. These are two duties. They come hand in hand, side by side. No, no one can substitute the other. Remember this. People ask me, is it more important to recite or to understand? I say they are both important. Subhanallah. They come hand in hand. What's the point of reciting without knowing the meaning? And what's the point of knowing the meaning without reciting? Subhanallah. Try. Recital. These are the words of Allah. You should be proud to repeat them. Amazing. You know, I recently I visited one Middle Eastern country and amazingly, there was a man who spoke a little bit of Urdu, but he did not understand it. And he started speaking to a certain person who knew the Urdu language. And I asked him, do you speak Urdu? He said, no, I just memorized this off by heart. And I told him, luckily, whoever told you what it was spoke the truth. Do you know what that means? Sometimes they can lie to you, teach you a swear word and say, this means good morning. <laughs> so now you're looking at someone and swearing them and you think it means good morning. And they look at you and say, astaghfirullah. You're wondering, what are you saying? So, Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah. Allah has blessed us. My brothers and sisters, we are all blessed. Without exception. Everyone is blessed. But sometimes we do not realize the blessings of Allah upon us. So, are we, to de are we going to develop, inshallah, the link with the Quran starting today? <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah. And I hope we are true to our word. Wallahi, it's, it's not for me. It's for Allah, the sake of Allah. And it's for our benefit at large. Each one will benefit himself. You know, the Quran also teaches us whoever does good is for himself. Man amila salihan wa man asa'a fa'alayha wa ma rabbuka bidhallamin lil abid. Whoever does good is for himself. And whoever does bad, it's going to be against himself. Allah does not oppress. We are the ones, subhanallah, who do wrong to ourselves. So the month of the Quran, we will this time, inshallah, welcome it in a way that if we were to die before it actually came, we would still be rewarded because we have made good intentions. Another very beautiful uh, way of welcoming Ramadan and even of utilizing Ramadan. We welcome Ramadan by... Firstly, like I said, we increase our fasting, we increase our acts of worship, we increase perhaps the connection with the Quran from now. I will get to a few other pointers in a few moments. But to plan what you are going to do in the month of Ramadan. Because lunchtime you have almost an hour. Before we used to spend that lunchtime, perhaps we go out, we eat. But this time there will be a lunchtime. And you know what? We are not going to be using that for eating. So can I tell you one way of using that hour? You go to the masjid, you read your Salat al and you organize and arrange for someone in that hour to teach you the Qur'an. To teach you something about the Qur'an. Such that when the month finishes, you have benefited in a very big way. Very big way. And it continues with you throughout the other 11 months so that you have worshipped Allah in a beautiful way. You know, it's like a catapult. You know how a catapult works? You have this catapult and you have a stone. You put the stone at, in, in one part of it and you pull it back. How much do you pull it back? A little bit. It, that uh, stone will actually shoot out of there very, very far. So to me, Ramadan is like a catapult. You're actually pulling back and you throw. When you throw, it helps you for the other 11 months. By the time the stone lands, you are already in another month of Ramadan. You follow what I'm saying? This is spirituality. It's one way of looking at it. There are so many other ways. So it is so vigorous. It requires energy such that you've used it so powerfully in this month that the rest of the 11 months, you are just sailing, you are flying, you are cruising, cruising. And when by the time it comes to land, you are already, you have the stone again and you pull it back and you are again moving for the other 11 months. So the discipline that is achieved through the month of Ramadan is unique and amazing. Let me mention to you one thing. There are certain things that are haram to eat. Do you agree? Like for example, you have pork, you have alcohol, you have so many other things, that which is not slaughtered correctly and whatever else, so many things are prohibited. You're not allowed. Now look, for one whole month, from dawn to dusk, we stay away from that which is halal. Water is halal. I cannot have it in Ramadan during that time, from dawn to dusk. Why? Discipline myself for the sake of Allah. Allah said, don't have it. 
So if I managed to stay away from that which was halal for one whole month, then surely after that, I can appreciate that which is halal by eating it and stay away from haram at least, at least. So I did not drink water. I did not have relations with my own spouse, which is otherwise halal. But in the daytime of Ramadan, it is a big prohibition. No, control yourself, discipline yourself, restrain yourself. That is what Ramadan is all about. You restrain yourself, you control yourself, subhanallah. So, for one whole month, I stayed away from that which was halal. For the other 11 months, I can easily stay away from that which was haram. I'll appreciate the halal. When you have a sip of water after a day when you have been quite thirsty because you were fasting, the dua says, ذَهَبَ الظَّمَعُ وَابْتَلَّتِ الْعُرُوقُ وَثَبَتَ الْأَجْرُ inshallah. The dua when you are opening your fast at the end of the day, uh, you know, where we are appreciating the gift of Allah for having quenched our thirst with what? With water. This is why the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, either dates or water or both to open the fast at the end of the month. Uh, sorry, at the end of the day. And if we have opened the fast and we have had this water, don't you feel so good? Subhanallah, ibtallatil uruq. There is, you know, the wetness has gone down and, and the veins and all the system has now achieved that wetness of the water after a day when we kept ourselves hungry for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you appreciate the quenching of your thirst. Alhamdulillah. And you've had beautiful water. You appreciate water. Subhanallah. We're not yet talking about fruit juice. We only started with water. Imagine in Ramadan we are spoilt, where we have juices and fruit juices and fries and so many things. Some of them are actually unhealthy. Do you know that? Very unhealthy. The worst way to break your fast is with savouries. Do you know that? You know what are savouries? Samosas and pies and fries. That's the worst way to break your fast. Worst. From a health perspective. I'm not saying it's prohibited. No, no, no. You know, people are looking at me. I don't know what's the, point, the story. I think we're all used to it. What's wrong with the sheikh? You know, my pie. I love my pies, you know. But the truth is, I'm talking of a health perspective. Go back to the sunnah. Look at the benefit of the dates, the benefit of water. Look at the benefit of these things. Subhanallah, that which is healthy, remain in, within the health. There is another big problem that we have during the month of Ramadan. Do you know what it is? At night, we do qada of what we missed in the day, sometimes, with food. I promise you, we will eat all night until we drop dead. I don't know if you've seen the cartoon. I think it is done by Abu Productive, if I'm not mistaken. But where it shows a man who's fasting during the day, and he eats so much at night that he cannot eat taraweeh, and he's just like a dead person. And he's waiting for the next day. And he's enjoying it so much. In fact, the belly grew in Ramadan. People gain weight in Ramadan. May Allah protect us. Remember, it's about discipline. It's about your health. Allah has blessed you with this. From now, cut down a little bit on your food. فَإِن كَانَ لَا بُدَّ فَثُلُثٌ لِلطَّعَامِ وَثُلُثٌ لِلشَّرَابِ وَثُلُثٌ لِلنَّفَسِ You know, we eat. The Prophet ﷺ has taught us, you really want to have a nice meal, subhanAllah, you really want to eat. Well, remember, the best way of doing it is a third of solids, a third of liquids, and a third of air. When you get up from the laid tablecloth and you have now got off the, what we would say, the tablecloth, you would still have air of one third in your system. You are not totally full, subhanallah. You are not totally full because we are not living to eat. Remember this. We are eating to live. It's a difference. And we're not saying don't enjoy food. Enjoy it, mashallah. People like tasty food and so on. People like so many different things by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Enjoy them. Thank Allah. But within limits. Within limits meaning, I'm not saying thank Allah within limits. Thank Allah unlimited. But eat within limits. Because say for example, you like samosas. Okay? And the ones which have the mincemeat in it. Because sometimes, you know, you see a beautiful samosa, you bite into it and you just see these veggies and you say, oh no. It should have had something better inside. You know? There was a long time when they didn't have all these veggies and health stuff inside it. But say you like the mincemeat ones and you have one and two and five and ten and twenty. What will happen to you? You get sick. Why? Because not because the samosa was bad. It was very good. The way you ate it was bad. How you chose to eat it was bad. Like red meat. People say red meat is bad. No, sometimes you need it. But the way you eat it is bad. You have a little piece of the whole cow. There's a problem. <laughs> 
There's a problem. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. So remember, the discipline of food and drink during Ramadan should extend beyond Ramadan. You eat and drink after Ramadan also, but hang on. Remember to reach out to those who don't have. Remember to reach out to those who don't have. Even if it is with one real, one little dollar, remember to reach out to them wherever and however you can. Even a small amount. Ittaqun nara wa law bishiqqi tamra. You know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encouraging us to do good. He says fear the fire even if it means by a portion of the date. So remember this. When we eat, sometimes we, we are wasteful. Yesterday we spoke about the fridge that some people have started, subhanallah, putting outside their homes. Allah knows it works in some places. Perhaps it might not work in other places. You might have a different mechanism that might work even better. But at the same time, the point here is don't be wasteful. It's very tempting to be wasteful. When the food is remaining on that table after the people have finished eating, remember, do something constructive with it because there are others who do not have food, period. There are others who are, may Allah safeguard us. There are others who are busy eating that which otherwise would not be permissible. Allahu Akbar. There are people across the globe in different places who are picking on grains. Little children, I have seen snippets of our children in various parts of the world who are picking little grains and busy putting them in their mouths. And we are sitting here with so much and it's just thrown away. Is that the, is, is that the case? I believe we can do better, inshallah. Let's word it respectfully. We can do better, inshallah. We can actually do something. And remember, where there is a will, there is a way. If you are really serious about not wasting, you will manage. If you are really serious, you will manage. You will succeed. Something good will come out of it. And this is what we are taught as Muslim. So by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we hope from now to hold back a bit on your food, inshallah. You know, if you already have that discipline, alhamdulillah. If not, you can actually, not just because Ramadan is coming, but because you want to be a more healthy person. You know, I find, this is for myself, the day I've eaten a lot, I feel very lazy, very lazy. I think my system is busy digesting and so on, and by the time it's over, I'm tired because my system is working without me working. Even if I'm just sitting, I start yawning, and you start feeling lazy, and you want to sleep and so on. It's your system operating. But the minute or the day I have eaten slightly less, I feel very active. I want to do something. I've eaten a bit less, and I've chosen healthy food. Remember this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. May He grant us good health, and may He cure all those who are sick and ill. I mean. May He grant cure miraculously to those who are sick and ill across the globe. Brothers and sisters, another very important point to welcome the month of Ramadan is by engaging in a lot of istighfar. Ask Allah's forgiveness on a daily basis. Many of us take for granted the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a Nabi. He was a prophet of Allah, the best of creation, the most honored of all the messengers. He did not need to engage in seeking forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he did it on a daily basis. Daily basis, not once, not 10 times, but between 70 and 100 times, according to some of the narrations that are authentic. He used to say, Astaghfirullah, I seek your forgiveness, O oh Allah. Let's be honest, sometimes we lead a life, obviously that is very far from what the ideal is, but we forget to ask Allah's forgiveness. After salah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And we say, Astaghfirullah, 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 Allahumma anta salam, wa minka salam. You forgot what you said. You don't even know what you said. It was lip service. Lip, you know what lip service means? Your lips moved, your tongue said it, but you, your concentration wasn't there. So you don't even know that you've actually asked Allah to forgive you because your heart was not present. So this is why become present. I said a lot of istighfar. Ask Allah's forgiveness. Oh Allah, forgive me. And when you ask Allah's forgiveness constantly, change your life. Start coming to the masjid, to the house of Allah. You will find a great change in your life if you tried your best to fulfill all your five salah in the masjid, in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Come early and see what happens. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. Beautiful month of Ramadan. Like we said, istighfar. Develop your link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is your maker. And He will open your doors one after the other. Another thing, start reaching out to other people. It must not always only be about me, me and myself and I. No. 
It must be about us. It must be about them sometimes. Look at others. Reach out to them in a beautiful way. Pray for them. Go and visit the elderly. Visit the sickly. You should be getting a feeling of goodness when you visit an old person. Subhanallah. You will find lots of wisdom. They have seen the world. They have seen so much. You will find lots of goodness. It is one of the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Go and visit the sickly. Go and visit your relatives. Solve problems and matters. Resolve matters. A winner is he who resolves problems. You have a family matter, a feud between the family. Try your best to solve it. Try and try hard. It's not going to be easy. But you will be known in the eyes of Allah as a person who tried his best to maintain family ties. A person who is a maintainer of good family ties is not he who has a tit-for-tat relationship. You know what that means? They give me something, I give them something. They give me something, I give them something. I remember I went to one country. May Allah grant us forgiveness. I went to one country and someone invited me to a wedding. Some of you will know this because it's the culture in some countries. And as I was entering the venue, there is a man sitting outside with a book. And he tells you, Sheikh, he, he asked me a question. Can I write your name? I said, no, 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 thank you. Thank you. No. And he just looked at me. He gave me such a dirty look. I didn't know what was the, what is the issue. Because I was unaware of the culture. Sheikh, you want to write your name? I said, no, I, I, I really, it's okay. I don't need to write my name. And I went in. And I went in and I had the meal and everything. When I came out, the same man asked me, Sheikh, did you enjoy the meal? I said, hey, mashallah, that's very nice. He said, so would you like to write your name? I said, no, thank you. He looked at me and he said, but... I said, what's the problem? He said, everyone is writing. I said, what are they writing? He says, you have to write your name. So I said, okay, so write it. He said, so how much are you giving? <laughs> well, I am not joking. I was shocked because I was new to the culture. I guarantee you, some of you know what I'm talking about. I guarantee you. So he, 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 he said, okay, I write. I said, what do you mean? He said, you have to pay. You have to come. He said, you think we invited you for free? <laughs> what? I first time coming across this culture, you know? And then he wrote my name and I'm looking that they said so much. I won't say the currency because you'll know where it was. They said so much, so much, so much. I said, oh, he said, you know what? You are from abroad. You're from outside. We're expecting something better from you. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajim. And you know what? It so happened that that moment I did not have cash in my hand. And I was so embarrassed. I told him, you know what? I can write, but I will have to send it to you. He said, don't make excuses, Sheikh. People respect you. I said, no. <laughs> so then I had to talk to him, to engage him, for him to believe me. And this is a true story. The man, he, he then tells me, he said, you know what? Uh, let me explain. I said, can you tell me the culture? I need to understand this. He said, look, when we invite people, we, as they're coming in, they, they give towards the expenses or the bride, the groom, whatever it is, right? And they write their name and amount and they give the amount. So we gather the amount and so on. And you know, it's, it's considered a gift. And if you haven't given on your way in, you give on your way out. And normally when you have a good meal, you can write your name twice, which means going in, you wrote something and you had such a nice meal. When you came out, you said, mashallah, excellent, write my name again. I give you something more. <laughs> so he says, then what happens? The day there is a wedding in your family, even if it is 10, 20 years later, we take the book out. And we see what you gave when it came to our family. Wallah, I'm not joking. And then we give a similar amount or something equivalent. And I said, Wallahi, this is the furthest away that I know from Islam. It defeats the purpose of the walima. It defeats the purpose of brotherhood. And Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, I am using this platform to say, stop it. Stop it. Don't do that. It's wrong. You want money? Collect donations. Don't have such a big wedding. What's, what's the big deal? If you cannot afford it, have something simple. Simple. And even if you can afford it, you can invite the whole world. But keep it simple. There is a difference between big and small and simple and complicated. So if you have a simple wedding, even if it is very big, no harm. But if you have something that goes beyond the limits of Allah, even if it is a small wedding, it's wrong. And this type of culture that we have clung to in some areas, Wallahi, I found this later on, even in the UK, some of the people of a similar background were doing the same thing. They have a hall, they invite you and they have a man with a book. It's just as well that now I know what the book is all about. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefit us. We have a book of deeds that we are worried about. They have a book of money that they are worried about. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. However, the month of Ramadan is such that we become generous. Generous to the degree that we give out. Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ajwadan nas. He was the most generous of people anyway. But in Ramadan, he was even more generous. So much so that the hadith describes it as karrihi al-musala. Karrihi al-musala means the wind that is moving, that is, you know, blowing. If the wind is blowing, like now this fan is on, for example, it comes to me and it comes to anyone who is in the path. Anyone who is in the path of it. Subhanallah, it's wind that catches everyone, which means the generosity reaches everyone. I'm generous to you with my smile. I'm generous to you with my time. I'm generous to you with whatever Allah has blessed me with by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we will engage in istighfar. We will, we will try and welcome this beautiful month by turning to Allah and by developing our character and conduct, by improving the relationship we have in our homes and houses. A lot of us have a lot of room for improvement with our relations with our own children, in our relations with our wives and our husbands perhaps. We have so much that needs to be done, but sometimes we, are, we couldn't be bothered. We are too busy doing some other things. Before you know it, life will be over. You know, nowadays time is flying. That says, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has prophesied this. يَتَقَارَبُ zaman. One of the prophecies of towards the end of the time. Time will begin to fly. It will be crumpled. Crumpled meaning a month will pass as though it was just a day. Honestly. You would recall the day you were married, the older ones from amongst us. And your child is already 20 years old. How did those 20 years go? I can't remember. I don't know. What were the highlights of your 20 years? You can finish them in two sentences and five. Where did the time go? So we are wasting time somehow. It's seeping. There is a leakage. You know, if you have a water meter and all your taps are closed in your house and the water meter still keeps on flowing, you know, it still keeps on rotating and moving, there is a leakage somewhere. You need an expert plumber to come in and identify where the leak is unless your meter is faulty. So what would happen? He would come in. If he cannot identify it, call in another expert. They will identify, you know what? This is your problem. This is where the water is leaking under the ground and you are paying a big bill for this water. The same is happening to our time. It's seeping, it's leaking. We're using it sometimes for that which is not constructive. It's destructive, it's a waste. It's a waste of time. So look at it and every minute should count. Ask yourself, how did I use it? This is why we say there is no room for laziness in Islam. No room for procrastination in Islam. Do not leave today's work for tomorrow just because you feel you will be able to do it tomorrow. In fact, tomorrow's work, if you can do it today, a productive Muslim will bring it in and do it now. So that tomorrow something else might come up and you can achieve. This is why we say, let's start benefiting for the month of Ramadan from now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and grant us goodness and ease. So I hope and I pray the few words I've said, I just noticed my 45 minutes are up by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope and I pray the few words I have said have actually touched some chords at least. Because you know when we speak of preparation for Ramadan, we could speak up to Ramadan and even into Ramadan. But the reality is we need to start getting closer to Allah. Bearing in mind we might not see the beginning of the month. It really comes back and it comes back and it comes back every year. There will be one year when we will not see the Ramadan because we will be gone. One year. It's going to happen. It's either this time or some other time. So bear in mind that this is the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us. That we are seated here in his house. May he forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May He grant us ease and goodness. May He open our doors. May He make us from those who can really make resolutions that are current. And here and now, we've spoken about quite a few of, quite a few of them. Let's hope that we can pledge right here, right now, that we will engage in at least one of the matters that we've discussed today as positive resolutions in order to enhance ourselves as good Muslimin to become better people so that when the month of Ramadan comes we will already be on a beautiful level and we will excel and improve and we will know how to even welcome the months after Ramadan that are so beneficial and so beautiful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and may He bless 
the entire globe. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all until we meet again sometime in this beautiful city or elsewhere. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah, bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma, bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.